Hansa Studios in Berlin has an incredible history, having played host to David Bowie, Iggy Pop and Nick Cave during their own Berlin periods, as well as U2, R.E.M. and Depeche Mode, among others. This isn't just a history lesson though, as Hansa still houses busy commercial studios. We got the grand tour from Tilo of Berlin Music Tours. The room that we are standing in is former Studio 2, the big hall by the wall, as Bowie and Iggy and the others used to call it, which was just an hour back, the wall location, like 200 meters and the Stresemannstraße crossing, so that was close. And it was used in the beginning, uh, this room, as an event place for the society of the builders or the union of the building companies in Berlin, uh, built in 1910 to 1913. And it had various usings throughout the years as an event place, as a concert hall. Uh, as you can hear, it has a nice, still a nice acoustic and reverb in the room. So that's what they were paying attention to in the old days, to have a nice acoustic in these old rooms. And actually, Ariola founded in the 60s as a recording space, as they were searching for a nice old room to record classical music. And they started to record classic. It was getting more and more. And uh, the recent owners of the house came in the mid 70s to uh, buy the whole property and um, establish their Hansa Studio 2, or as Bohinigi, as I said, called it the big hole by the wall um, in this room. The Meistersaal is um, for recording space, it is quite big. We have almost 270 square meters here in this recording part. Um, the room is almost seven meter high ceiling, which is also, yeah. I usually with the studio, with these cabins, we work since many decades, although there is big recording facilities like Abbey Road Studio 2 is about the same size um, for the recording space, but different there is they have a connection with the control room with a stairway up where you can see uh, from the control room down in the recording, which we don't have here, as I said, the control room uh, over 20 meters away and this different uh, communication. And we still can use the room as a recording space, which is happening more and more. It's even, I would say, 30 or maybe 40% of the year. It's used as a recording facility. So in the back of this red curtain, for instance, there are connecting fields, true lines to other recording uh, areas uh, and control rooms in the house. The recording sessions in this room were always a bit strange or difficult because it was not built as a studio. So what we don't have, first of all, is of course like control room connection with the window system separated. So all this was not here in the room based or set up. It was just over 20 meters from where we are standing was a control room with all the gear. So they had to help out with cameras on statives and on monitors to communicate with another as they couldn't see each other in this moment. Plus engineers were supporting in the control room, the artists like Bowie or Iggy, when they recorded or did uh, their work here. The sessions themselves in the house were pretty experimental in this moment, as this also was an experimental phase regarded to Bowie and Tony Visconti, his producer, and Brian Eno. So as you may know, they were big fans of Krautrock sound. So the Kraftwerk and Neu and Ken and Tangerine Dream and all those nice bands that they were influencing them. The sessions were full of experiments with recording here or recording other empty rooms, sending sounds in the rooms or playing piano or drums, of course, in this big hall and using this big room sound um, on these on this records, right? A typical setup for Hero's uh, um, vocal, for instance, he was putting the singer, he was putting David in the middle and had a setup of microphones and distances of meters to have the effect beside his close-up microphone that he used for the, for the vocal, the louder he sang, the room should open up and give it even more depth or more yeah, deepness um, from this room sound. But uh, also um, Robert Fripp um, reported about very, very energetic and yeah, trying out sounds, feedbacking in the room, recording um, on heroes or the drums. Uh, by Dennis Davis, as Tony also said, just in my back, recorded mainly um, on the stage because they like the sound of the drum on the stage in that moment. There is um, all the bands beside Bowie that I mentioned or Iggy that recording here, U2 for instance, um, big fans of this room. The main part of Achtung Baby album was recorded in the, in the room in the, in the beginning, also with a live setup to get in the room feeling and to perform. But uh, Depeche Mode, also a um, British band, big fans of this whole. In fact, Martin Gore sang naked in this room. 
Nick Cave worked on, for instance, several albums here. As Nick Cave is the longest Berliner, if you take all the international people that we had here, like Bowie Indigi or Martin Gore of the Mode living in the city, and Nick Cave almost a decade from the early 80s to the early 90s, recording, for instance, also here, uh, Until the End of the World, soundtrack for Wim Wenders' movie Until the End of the World, which is nice speaking intro. I love you till the end of the world. So this, yeah, also was done in this room, right? And experiments, all the time, experiments, sound checking, looking for the best angle to record. Tony Visconti on Bar, for instance, on this, on this Bowie piece, he said he was putting the, the microphone gear for the room sound in all the four corners of the room to have the idea that the sound is developing before it hits actually the, the, the room sound mics, which is kind of unusual. If you want to record a room, you mainly put a stereo mic somewhere above or at the sides to get some of the feeling of the room. In this case, there was a big experiment on bar um, with using the whole atmosphere of the room with this kind of quadraphonic recording he did. And Nick Cave also used this room, Einsturz in Neubauten, collapsing new buildings, uh, translated word by word with Nick Cave, forming with, Nick, with him, Nick Cave in the bad seats, of course. Imagine when they were here, this was all full with drill bits, toilet doors, beer barrels, oil tanks, or whatever they were using to do some percussive uh, and pre-industrial sound and using this room in a very different way than a classic orchestra would. It's not just this main hall that's seen all the action. Even the spiral staircases at the side of the building have been used by many famous productions as reverb chambers. This they even used on, on Heroes, this stairway for recording some of the instruments, like checking guitar sounds with putting their amps in this room, sending guitar sounds through the amps and speakers in the stairway, and recording it with a natural reverb or like more tube sound, as you can hear it when we're here. Uh, in the stairway and having fun with trying out this sound and using also not regular rooms and areas for recording as the recording space would be right next to us but also experimenting here and if you would also like do clap to follow that's as far as you could follow this is a long long tube sound and you can you can hear that on, on uh, take a listen to the guitar sounds on, on heroes a bit you can find this again what used to be the control room of Studio 2 is now a bar, but the history is still there if you know where to look. We are now in the former control room of Studio 2. So as we came from the recording from this big hall um, and there was no view connection, they had to use this old meeting room. And right in my back, they would have sit on the control desk um, facing the window where we have this, this nice firewall there in the back these days. Uh, that hides the free view. They had a pretty free view from this room until the wall, uh, this 200 meters distance on top of a building. There were several other watchtowers around, but this one on top of the um, of this these days ministerial building, they had a close interacting with them and surely this year year. And connected with uh, the monitor camera that was set up on speakers on the left or right side. They just had a monitor, a TV monitor for the camera connection and communicating with the artist or also sometimes a camera here and a monitor there if the producer or artist in the recording wanted to see them. Then in my back, um, the control desk, uh, look into the, facing the window, look into the window, about here where I stand, the tape machine section with 16 or 24 track tape machines, plus at the sides, patch bay and other gear to record or to mix also in the room. The look out of the window contained um, on the top of a building one of the watchtowers that we had here in this close 200 meters distance to the Berlin Wall, patrolled by East German border guards. And even as Eduard Meyer, boy sound engineer, told me he loved to do fun with those guys sometimes, just taking one of the lamps that were hanging over the console and flashing them out to the border guards to say them hello here again. And he told me a fun story when he did it with uh, Tony Visconti, Bowie and Diggy for the first time. They totally went pale and covered behind the desk here and were like, hey, stop, stop, they will shoot on us. And he was like, come on, get up, it's all cool. But um, in Cold War situation, of course, no one would really know if there would be a reaction. So this was adventure space, definitely, to work here. And to be so close to the wall, Checkpoint Charlie is not far away, our most famous checkpoint. And um, this was strange working situation, different to, of course, other studios in the world. Upstairs in Studio One is where most of the action takes place these days. We are now uh, on our way through the house in Studio One, which is um, together with Hansa Mix Room, the part that still runs under Hansa wings 
And this was open in the early 80s as a studio, which is a nice room in a room construction. Um, as this was extra built up, um, because this floor was um, demolished also in the Second World War bombing we had of the house. So this was all kind of open, ruined, also on the top. The room has this recording space where we're standing in uh, for having a piano or a um, vocal session or whatever you want to record in this place. Plus we have um, a drum cabin, or which is not a cabin anymore, a room uh, that has a different sound as there's uh, polished marble or marmot texture with a strong reflection in the room. This is um, a lot of absorbing material which makes the room pretty dry as you yeah, listen to the room sound here, pretty dry sounding. Plus there's also a bass or guitar booth uh, here at, the, uh, at my right side uh, where you can have also quite often a drum or we have drums these days recorded there as not everyone likes the reflection uh, or the strong reflection, sharp reflection in the old drum room. And also the sound dividing walls, which we took up here from uh, Studio 2 Hall, from the big one, um, if you want to have this real dry sound. But um, pretty nice setup as a studio, is like a lot of American studios would have been built in this late 70s, early 80s style, with a mix of the texture or the, um, this, this tree elements. And um, what we don't have uh, downstairs in the big hall we have here, that's a straight look over to the control room, as it's usually in every studio, to have a conversation, which they couldn't have downstairs in the hall. So this is also something um, that they paid attention here when they had yeah, renovation costs, I think, of five or six million, Deutschmark even. The bands that uh, are come to the place, especially also the recent bands, if we take, as we talked a bit um, already about R.E.M. working here for like three and a half weeks, um, um, in 2010, and collapse into now, or we had uh, Manic Street Preachers for the last album, Futurology, working up here, and also the Hives uh, collecting some ideas here uh, in Studio One and in the mix room, and partly uh, these bands always go also down in the hall um, to combine this. So this is possible from up here then to use also the hall as a recording space. And so um, also Green Day used it for collecting uh, ideas or um, Pharrell Williams or other big bands that, uh, or artists that used this place recently. So what Depeche did, for instance, um, um, on uh, their albums, on for instance the second album, Some Great Award, they were sending up here from the fourth floor we are the true lines that we have down in the in the in the hall, uh, sounds of drums, and recording this with the sound of the room, with the big room, and sending this back up here to the fourth floor. So this was kind of a feedback chain they built up um, to sound um, big, very big on their drums. You can follow on people are people track, especially with the bass drum figures. There's a massive room sound on the bass drum, which is nice. And uh, this went so, they went so nuts with the room downstairs, beside Martin Gore was singing naked. I think we didn't finish the story downstairs. But um, they were using this for a kind of a pre-mastering even. So they were up here on the fourth floor and they were sending um, with Gareth Jones, with their engineer and producer and Peter Schmidt, another engineer from Hansa back then. They were sending the stereo sound of the whole mix down in the hall and re-recording this with the sound of the room so no one would really do that. After mixing, as you know, you would go to a mastering studio and then edit the last final uh, edits you can do before uh, it's, it's completely done. But they wanted to have this big room sound, this cathedral sound kind of of, uh, of Studio 2. Uh, so this was also done technically by up here, sending in the room recording and then an amount of the reverb plus the original was mixed together. So the, the result is that on, on the whole album is a massive room sound on every track. There's a lot of gear of course used also, but a big amount also is the, the sound again of the big hall. Studio One's drum recording room has some interesting architectural features that are very much of their time, but that can still be used to breathe life into modern recordings. This room is the drum booth or room, which has a special um, aesthetic and acoustic as we have this polished marble or marmot texture in. One of the specialities in this studio, um, it's really built without any 90 degree angle to avoid um, that we have flattering in these rooms. So even the doors uh, um, here um, at this booth or at the next one are some degrees falling out or falling in the room to avoid that flattering. The top and the side fills are not parallel completely to another to avoid that. And the aesthetic was like that in the early 80s. The drums should sound a bit sharp 
in the high frequencies or a bit present or over present. That's a bit different to the aesthetic today. So quite often I see them nowadays in the small booth or in, a, in another part of uh, the recording area with the drums as not everyone likes the sharp reflection. But still some people like that. Just some days ago I saw it with a production here and, and um, or even two drums that were recording, one in the big recording room, one in the cabin here. Some people even like to sing in the room as they like the reflection here. Um, or for guitar or for bass recording, uh, um, if you want to mic the amp or the, the speaker also. Um, this is used from time to time also. So it's not only strictly a drum room, but this is what it was built for. And uh, also here high investment in the, in the room. Um, to have this yeah, nice, polished, sharp reflection that we have. The control room of Studio One is dominated by a custom-built SSL console and is awash with other vintage gear. We are in the control room of Studio One and uh, we sit here in front of this nice old SSL 4000E console in Hansa blue, as they ordered this, especially in this color in the UK, and got it. So they had um, at least two of them costing, as far as I know, back then 1.3 million Deutschmark for one of those desks. And um, even one floor down under us, uh, there was a studio where a similar desk like this was standing just to train and rehearse for the assistants or for the engineers to be prepared to record here. And um, yeah, 56 channel, which they added eight uh, channels on the left side. So it's 64 channel that was in the early 80s, really big power. This um, has to be handled carefully, as this old desk no one would buy, surely new. <laughs> but um, they use them almost in every production I see they're doing here. It's running through the desk and um, synchronized with the Pro Tools then. Also, this desk was the first with a kind of recall possibility. It was not a complete recall with moving faders and all this, what we have today. So you had to find the same position again. But uh, so easy or a, a, a human recall in a way, but uh, it was possible to do. And uh, yeah, that was making the work much, much more easier as you could do another band in between and then go back to your setup you had before. Nice desk, nice sound, and hopefully it will, it will keep on running. There's not many people that can handle that still um, and, and um, to supervise it. So knock on wood. We have also in the room um, here at my left side, the old tape machines, the 24 tracks, although they are rarely in use, is mainly, of course, like all around the world, everyone works with, mainly with Pro Tools. And which is pretty nice also here at my left side um, is the dynamic rack, of course, with the U-rays and the menlays and the tube tags and all these nice old gear um, that the bands like these days when they come here, not to use it only as a plug-in, although they sound fantastic, meanwhile, but to use the real gear. And um, that is also, beside the history that we talked a lot uh, today about history of the place, um, that we also have this vintage gear which you combine with this hard disk recording and can be, or can have both worlds, the old and the new world if you want. If you can't get enough of Hansa, watch our interview with Max Martin mix engineer Michael Ilbert, who works in the original mix room of the legendary Berlin Studios. For more video content, subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. And for loads more features like this, subscribe to the magazine, available in print, on our website, or on tablet. Thanks for watching.